to our online audience watching this program from afar. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our guest artists who will be presenting the music on our program today. Uh, these are music artist professionals who are teaching at colleges, universities, and other venues around the country, and we're so pleased that they have been gathered together here to join us here at Fall Island. This is the part of Fall Island each year in which we look to the past to explore specific segments of song repertoire and to put them into different perspectives. Today is our first lecture ever to commemorate a single year. Many historians today summarize 1919 as rivaling 1968 as the worst year in the 20th century in America. And I know that's a dreadful opening for uh, a catch, <laughs> catch sentence, but I tend to think instead of the turbulent events of 1919 as a great divide that leaves an old world behind and lays out the tracks for a new society that will begin with the Roaring Twenties. Or in the words with which Charles Dickens uh, so wonderfully opens his tale of two cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Indeed, between those two poles, we're going to encounter an unusual amount of bittersweetness and irony today. These are distinctive characteristics of this remarkable year. But we will also have some fun today, as we always do here. So before we start singing our songs, I would like to take just a few minutes to consider some of the events that begin this year. And this will introduce us to the main issues that will connect with our songs. This year opened with Teddy Roosevelt's death on January 6th. As always, we gave our farewell in song, like this one, Goodbye, Teddy Roosevelt, You Were a Real American. The uh, first couple weeks uh, from now, the Paris Peace Conference is going to begin to reassemble a world that was broken by the newly ended Great War. Representatives of the big four nations include our own President Woodrow Wilson, President Wilson, who led the nation through the Great War, is working feverishly, splitting his time between Europe and here. But for now, prohibition is very much an issue, knowing that such a law will never be able to keep alcohol off of the streets. Wilson sensibly vetoes the so-called Volstead Act. But Congress overrides his veto and allows prohibition to take effect as the 18th Amendment. President Wilson is also voicing his strong support for the decades-old fight for women's right to vote, which will finally be ratified in August of next year as the 19th Amendment. By the end of this year, Wilson's frenetic schedule will lead to a serious debilitating stroke from which he will never recover, really, leaving his wife Edith as the de facto president. But back to this eventful January week, the great Boston molasses flood hit the north end of that city when two enormous tanks of the gooey stuff exploded, resulting in 21 dead and many more injured and quite a mess to clean up. Uh, mercifully, no songs were published about this odd event. <laughs> but I did find it irresistible to mention molasses as a metaphor for today's themes of both disaster and bittersweetness. Thanks for this, this small groan, I appreciate that. <laughs> so the, the same week on the opposite coast, civil unrest regarding unions will erupt this month in my hometown of Seattle. The shipyard strike will lead in just two weeks to the Seattle general strike involving over 65,000 laborers, the first such strike in American history. Fear of leftist radicals led to a de deputizing a special militia complete with machine guns. And the frightening strike fortunately turned out to be an entirely peaceful display of solidarity because Seattleites are by nature a very progressive but, but nice people who aren't into violence. So although within two months, uh, violence and bombings over the same kinds of issues will erupt elsewhere, not in Seattle. Uh, so, uh, but wait. What, what fine civil servants enter here? Yes, they are Seattle's finest, as we might have guessed by the proud expressions on their faces. <laughs> so why the masks? The same, uh, the same masks that they were just wearing are being worn by these, these patients here. We're turning now to something so grim that it's been buried largely in history. 
we're in the midst of the most devastating pandemic in, ever recorded in history. It's the great influenza epidemic of 1918 to 19, the so-called Spanish flu. It'll infect 500 million people, which is a third of the planet, and kill 20 to 50 million people. Uh, this is a scene from Camp Funston in the middle of the country in Kansas. And I know of no song from this era that references the Spanish flu epidemic, uh, although uh, four years ago, the song came out in 1915 that is called Some Little Bug Is Going To Find You. Um, it's a comic song, actually, with many verses that tell about various foods you will eat that will kill you because of tomaine poisoning or whatever, but it's, it's, it's a funny song, it really is. So, so <laughs> bacterial, death is, is really hilarious, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> viral death, maybe not so much. We're barely out into mid-February, but now for something happier at last. Here on February 17th, marching down Fifth Avenue is the 369th Regiment, the so-called Harlem Hellfighters, white and black Americans alike, welcome home this very first group of our soldiers coming back from the war following the armistice of late last year, the year of most of the songs on today's program. The New York Tribune wrote in its coverage of the parade, they said, the entire regiment was awarded Francis War Cross under fire for 191 days. They never lost a prisoner or a foot of ground. The regimental band became famous throughout France for their performances of the new kind of music called jazz and for their music director, whom we will meet in just a few minutes. Of the hundreds of songs that have been published during the Great War, the vast majority are march songs. These evoke the spirit of that essentially military activity in which were at, uh, actually sung during marching. When Yankee Doodle Learns to Parlez-vous Francais was one of the top eight songs of last year and still popular, while retaining the characteristics of a march song, it playfully portrays American soldiers learning French so that they can cavort with the French ladies. And this sheet music cover is certainly one of the most joyous from this era. It's filled with kinetic energy and complete abandon, and it also cleverly unites two immediately recognizable national melodies, one American and the other French, of course. Another French one is Someone know that one? Yes. Yeah, Offenbach, Orpheus and Hades, he's also used it in the Gekke Paris. Yeah. Well these are united into this melody. a clever thing, I wanted to point it out because it, we don't want to miss it. I know of no other mel melody in popular music that unites the, these two songs like that. And I think it's a wonderful uh, metaphor for the, the uniting of the two countries into one entity that will, will fight this war. So while playing with these, this, these binational musical elements, the text makes light fun of the French language and an exuberantly stereotyped can-can. And we would like to invite the audience to join in the fun by singing out on the second chorus. <laughs> <laughs> 
exciting musical development has been happening. The first jazz recordings emerged just two years ago in 1917, and the exciting rhythms of the new language have already spread like wildfire here, at home, and abroad. Here's a major hit composed just last year by Bob Carleton, a US Navy serviceman, but also a Tin Pan Alley composer, and has lingered into this year of 1919. Carleton will compose over 500 songs, but none anywhere close to this in popularity. In this song, we can already hear that the rhythms of a new sound has replaced those of ragtime, that praise that had lingered for the last 20 years and whose rhythms will now be subsumed into jazz. It is remarkable that Jada could have become such a popular hit. It really says nothing except that it's a funny little bit of melody and that it's soothing and appeal to me. And then most importantly of all, it says Jada, 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 Jing, Jing, Jing. <laughs> That's the, the chorus, the entire thing. Although I'm trying to refrain really from getting into musical analysis, I wanted to point out a new procedure that starts to, to happen in a lot of songs in this new jazz age, in which the first part of the, the A section is static rhythmically, and then it's followed by a kicker, which is, has dotted and other kinds of active rhythms. So this one is jada, 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 ding, ding, ding. So this is something that gets picked up later by Gershwin, and also um, Harry Warren, who wrote uh, 42nd Street and a lot of the other depression musical uh, film scores. The, uh, this is something, a brand new kind of sound. So let's hear it. <laughs> and please come in on the second chorus. 
sure just how I know these things of the future, but I somehow feel confident in 1919 that Jada will lie dormant for about 20 years until 1938, after which it will be revived at the approach of World War II, along with other World War I songs like Over There by George M. Cohan and Irving Berlin's uh, God Bless America, of course. Uh, Jada will then continue to be recorded by dozens and dozens of artists for the next 60 years. And this list will include major artists like Frank Sinatra, Peggy Lee, uh, Louis Armstrong, Frankie Valli in the Four Seasons. And for those of you who will be born in the 1990s or will be their parents, then Sharon, Lois, and Bram. This is one of the fascinating aspects about our American songs is their way of vanishing and then suddenly reemerging many decades later to a receptive new audience, many of whom have no knowledge or uh, uh, of the original composers or about the era in which they were composed. We are overjoyed to have our young men and women back home again, but a shadow lies over our hearts for those who will never return. Many of the, these were killed in Belgium's no man's land, that supremely dangerous area of the field between the barbed wire fences. The artillery barrage typically left these areas devoid of vegetation or any other natural features as we can see in this 1919 view. This place is Flanders fields where many soldiers lost their lives and which will eventually become the final resting place for thousands. One of the greatest elegies ever written for those who have made the supreme sacrifice is the already famous poem by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. It honors those who have found their final resting place in Flanders fields. McRae was a physician and poet from Guelph, Ontario in Canada, and he printed in Canadian journals since the 1890s, and his poems reveal his preoccupation with death. After his close friend was killed at the Second Battle of, Battle of Ypres in Flanders on May 2nd, 1915, McRae performed the burial service himself while noting how quickly poppies grew around the graves who had died at Ypres. The next day, he composed in Flanders fields while sitting in the back of an ambulance looking at the grave of his friend. The poem honors those who have found their final resting place in Flanders fields. It is in first person, the voices of the dead speaking from the grave at, of their fate and of the pleasures that they enjoyed in life just mere days before. John Philip Sousa is of course celebrated these days as the March King. And the general public may not be aware that his perf her performing medium was first of all not a band instrument but violin. And that's what he worked with in his early days as a musician. He's also the composer of 15 operettas and of many songs. His setting of McRae's text, just composed this year, is one of his most moving and a fitting tribute to those we remember with sadness and with deepest gratitude on this Memorial Day weekend. 
young men who were fortunate to come home are returning to a society on the verge of profound changes. And they were themselves changed by this, our first war to have been fought abroad. Boys and girls who had never left their homes in towns that were very small have suddenly found themselves in an eye-opening world of terrifying and exotic experiences across the ocean. So in 1919, we divide a more innocent world with, uh, from a new one. After Yankee Doodle has learned to parler le français and taste urban sophistication. America is facing the challenge of reabsorbing her citizens from the military, especially those worldly wise youths who will now become the energized new generation of the Roaring Twenties. So really, even in its humorous way, this song asks a serious question. How can soldiers return to quiet rural life as usual after going through such a life-changing experience as being in a horrific war? In 1880, just under 30% of Americans lived in the cities. And by 1917, when the US entered the war, there, there was 50% of the population now in the city. And that was growing thanks also to additional immigrants coming and landing in those cities. This song was first introduced to the, uh, to the public by Sophie Tucker, the so-called last of the Red Hot Mamas. And uh, Eddie Cantor was also one who added it to his stage set. And we're going to be hearing a bit about Eddie Cantor later too. Like many of the songs from the Great War, How Are You Gonna Keep Them Down on the Farm, will in the future become another of those that are revived and sung by soldiers in World War II and popularized by a generation of singers, notably Judy Garland. So again on this, please join us in the second chorus. jazz group, Jim Europe's 369th Infantry Band, has just made How Are You Gonna Keep 
from Down on the Farm, a hit this year after recording a version of it for Pathé Records. They are the band from the Army that we just saw marching triumphantly down Fifth Avenue a few minutes ago. Their band leader, arranger, and composer, James Reese Europe, known as Jim Europe, is one of our most important figures in a transition that is happening now, that of ragtime to jazz. Since 1910, he has directed the Clef Club. It's a large 125-member ensemble of African-American musicians who perform fast ragtime and two-step dancing music at high-class society events in Manhattan. As their music director, he helped the famous Vernon and Irene Castle, the dancing duo who popularized the waltz here and later a lot of the two-step dances and made them palatable for white audiences. And he also conducted the first recordings of an African-American band to be recorded by Victor. After having toured France during the war, Lieutenant Europe has just made a triumphant return with his Harlem Hellfires band. And here's another tune that he has made popular this year. <laughs> it, it contains new kinds of rhythmic features uh, that move beyond ragtime and are now entering the realm of jazz. One of these is open silence that occurs in the chorus under the title word jazzola, suggesting the stop time technique of early jazz. And this is the first we've heard it in popular songs. Armstrong was making his way up to Chicago, where he would now spread this new jazz idiom to that city. Over in New York, um, however, uh, Jim Europe, who has just just come here, uh, was giving a 
recital in, uh, of this band in Boston, and a couple of his band members were misbehaving, so he had to chastise them, and one of them was a, a percussionist who can, they can become very high strung sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, he, uh, he stabbed him, and then uh, he said, well, I'm fine, I'll go, just get me to the hospital, and he uh, sent somebody to take over for him, but he died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. So he was uh, here only a short time, and it's a, a very sad thing to see somebody who was going to be a great leader of, of jazz, and it would have gone much, much farther, much faster, were, were not for this catastrophe. So that's the, that's the bittersweet part of, of this. And uh, this is a scene here of his funeral in Boston. But there is, that's the bitter part, the sweet part of it is that um, Noble Sissel, who sang Jazzola, and I doubt as well as it was just done, personally, <laughs> and the pianist composer, Yubi Blake, uh, were part of Jim Europe's Clef Club, that big group that he ran with all those musicians. And after Europe's death, they collaborated to free musicals of black-faced minstrel elements to create a more dignified and authentic African-American musical theater. He was a real superstar in his day. And Cicel and Blake will become leading figures in the blossoming Harlem Renaissance, of which, uh, of which this man, Noble, will be a particularly important figure. And that's just taking flight this year as well. Now on to prohibition. Songs dealing with the upcoming prohibition amendment that I mentioned earlier outnumber those on almost any other issue this year. And these songs record the various ways in which our society would deal with the thought of this sudden deprivation. One way is defiance, like here, as in America never took water and America never will. And another is denial, anticipating what a fantastic party everyone will have, saying goodbye to their favorite drinks. And yet the cover gives away a bit of anxiety there as Father Time is holding up a clock threatening midnight. Another way to deal with it is to just uh, write an elegiac <laughs> litany to their favorite drinks, as in every day will be Sunday when the whole town grows dry. Uh, in which he says goodbye to Haig and Haig and various other beverages. But the one I chose for this is uh, one by somebody we already know. This is by Albert von Tilzer, the brother of that amazingly prolific Tin Pan Alley songwriter and publisher, Harry von Tilzer, who really uh, uh, mentored a lot of the songwriters in the previous generation. Although Albert can never match the output of his brother in terms of, of quality and, and number of pieces written, he has produced several important songs, like uh, one from a dozen years ago, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Here we're going to hear Alcoholic Blues. <laughs> 
that is sad. But there's no need for such sorrow, really, because when our country calls upon its citizens, good Americans, as always, consider carefully what their government requires of them. And then they go out and, and they, they do whatever they want to do, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is to go out and make their own. So once again, Americans with their unfailing spirit of industry and ingenuity come through by doing what must be done. So here we're making up a batch of hooch. Um, not very happy uh, about making things from scratch or recipes. Well, that's okay because your government has unwit unwittingly created a dangerously violent criminal underclass to pick up where the legal alcohol distributors left off and to supply you with what you need. So the new streetwise generation, fueled by bootleg liquor alongside this criminal element, are a couple of the essential ingredients of the arriving new age of the Roaring Twenties. For those of us not wanting to break the law, though, Irving Berlin suggests another solution. He says, I'll see you in C-U-B-A. <laughs> and this is something that the rich people could afford to do. They went to Cuba, and he tells in the song about the very nice people there and all the very nice beverages that they will supply you with. And these are just a few of the many songs dealing with this so-called noble experiment, which will eventually be rescinded in 14 years by another amendment. With the many troubles of 1919, it's no wonder that another bittersweet tune would come to be a major hit this year and for many, many years to come. Uh, the uh, chorus of this is fascinating because it has these undulating contours to it. I'm forever blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles in the air, they fly so high, nearly reach the sky. And then after undulating for a while, it, it says, and, uh, and then like my dreams, they fade and die. And then the highest note is the real punchline, fortune's always hiding, I have looked everywhere. I'm forever blowing bubbles, then it comes back down again. So it's like this, this bubbly thing happening and in the middle of the song is this really um, outcry of disillusionment. So it's, it's a happy song on the surface, but it has a real sorrow in it underneath. And it's this tension between the surface exterior and the, a, a gracefulness and this underlying discontent that I think has made it so poignant for so many generations. Um, it was introduced this past year in uh, the passing show of 1918 and published this year. And it will be recorded by every major band, orchestra, and singer in the next generation. Uh, and a, a particularly memorable appearance will be in the movie Public Enemy, the great prohibition gangster flick with Jimmy Cagney from 1931. And the song meshes with the film's themes of seeking fulfillment of one's dreams. And this time the dreams being achieved through crime only to have them fail. And this teaches that, that lesson they were always stressing in the movies that crime does not pay. And you see him getting shot over on the side there just to be sure. So uh, let's hear I'm Forever Blowing Bubbles. Thank you. 
considered going into his own publishing firm, so he would be his own boss. But first he was ex examining a, a relationship with the publisher Harms on Tin Pan Alley and brought in a song to see if they liked to publish it. And after he showed it, uh, he asked if there was somebody, somebody there who could play it. As we know, Berlin had very limited piano skills and relied on a secretary to, to, uh, to take it down. So this guy said, well, I have a kid in back who could take it down. So the kid came down, took down the, shop, the, the song, made a lead sheet, and played it in such a way that Irving Berlin hardly recognized his own tune. It was like a masterpiece of, of transcription. And so recognizing that this 20-year-old guy was really brilliant, Berlin told him that he would think about his position that was open as his own secretary. And he said, what is it really that you want to do? And the guy showed him some songs he had written. And Berlin listened to them and he said, what do you want to work for somebody else for? Work for yourself. And sure enough, that's what the kid did. And in that very year, 1919, that young pianist composer came out with his greatest hit all of a sudden. Um, Gershwin and his lyricist, who was then Irving Caesar, claimed to have written it, written the song in 10 minutes on the bus on their way back home and finished it up at Ger Gershwin's apartment. Uh, and after hearing the song at a party, the great Al Jolson, who was the most fabulous superstar of the day, heard, heard it and he wanted to integrate it into his show Sinbad, which carries a lot of hit tunes in it. He kept adding to it, which is playing at the Winter Garden Theater. Um, that, plus his recording of the tune, caused it by 1920 to be on the charts for 18 weeks, and of which nine were his number one position. Then it sold a million copies, and soon thereafter, two million records. So he never again had a hit like that, that song. Um, is, in terms of Swanee, what it is, it's, it's a parody of Stephen Foster's Old Folks at Home, and even references that title at the end of the chorus, The Old Folks at Home, is how the chorus ends. And, and by the way, if you don't know the origin of Suwannee River with Foster, with the old folks at home, he was actually, had never really been to the South, and he didn't know uh, what song he wanted to, to include, uh, or what, I'm sorry, what river he wanted to include as a real typically Southern ri river. And he was going to call it Way Down Upon the Yazoo River. And it didn't, no, didn't sound right. And he tried a couple of others. Then he asked his brother, and he just picked up an atlas and started looking around in it. And he saw a map of Florida. And he said, here's this river called the Swanee River. And he said, that's it. That's what I'll use. So that's, it's just a um, kind of a, a, a chance thing that that is the river that now we think of as being so quintessentially, quintessentially Southern. So um, after the uh, becoming one of Jolson's signature numbers, Judy Garland would own it in the next generation after reviving it in A Star is Born. And you will assist in reviving it today by joining in on the second chorus. <laughs> 
song that the young Gershwin read down for Irving Berlin on that day, and it was a remarkable moment because I think of how amazing it was that those two composers who would be such treasured members of the great American songbook met right then at that time. This is the revolutionary rag. It uh, was composed for a comic opera, that's what they called it, a comic opera, it was basically a musical production by George M. Cohan, and it's one of the many ragtime songs that Berlin had been writing throughout these first two decades of the 20th century. Berlin had rocketed to international fame just eight years earlier with Alexander's ragtime band, both here and abroad. And so he kept retrying the form in different ways to see if he could get the formula to work again. And he came up with pieces like that mysterious rag, that international rag, and the ragtime soldier man. However, although the rag will continue as a nostalgic throw, throwback in a kind of quaint way, its real heyday ends here. Uh, the message in this rag, though, is a very current and real concern in the country. Um, those growing up 30 years from now in the 50s and 60s will be uh, remember the, the haunting of the Red Scare that happened during the McCarthy era and the Hollywood blacklist and such. But the first big Red Scare was actually in 19, 1919. And this, is, this was haunting people just as badly as then. In these years, more workers in the city are becoming organized into unions than ever before, and there's been a 400% increase in union membership from 1915 to 1918, which is very threatening. American workers, particularly in my hometown of Seattle, are becoming increasingly radicalized, with many in the rank and file supportive of the recent revolution in Russia and working toward a similar revolution in the United States. And here's a common image of the day. It's the, the hand that will rule the world, one big union. The connection of communists with unions it begins in Seattle with the arrival of a distressed ship uh, a couple of years earlier. It had been battered up by a storm and was genuinely disabled. But it was um, parked in the dock there about the time that people started talking about this unions and stuff. So people thought of, that they were responsible for having uh, kind of fomented this insurrection of the unions and pro-Bolshevik ideas. Um, and then in the fall of this year, 1919, Seattle longshoremen are refusing to load arms destined for the anti-Bolshevik white army in Russia and attack those who attempted to load them onto the ship. And so the suspicions of communist involvement are, are expressed in pamphlets along with dark predictions about the future. Russia did it, that first one says. They, in other words, they caused the strike to happen and they're, they're, uh, uh, they're participating in this, this uh, trouble that's going on. On the right is a sort of a prediction of what happens with unions. Labor stepping down as strikes and walkouts. That leads to disorder and riots, then Bolshevism and murders, and then chaos, then what? And this is the, the kind of way of thinking. This, these were proliferating society at this time. So there's a lot going on in this turbulent year. And now Irving Berlin has his say about the Red Scare with a rag about another kind of rag. It's kind of a pun. In other words, it's about the Red Bolshevik flag. 
number by a different composer about the Red Scare was Look Out for the Bolsheviki Man. It's even made its way into the Ziegfeld Follies of 1919, and it's to the Ziegfeld Follies that we now turn. Um, those of you who are, may not be familiar with it, with the Follies. These are elaborate theatrical productions that have been happening on Broadway annually for the past dozen years, and they're going to be happening for the next dozen years until Ziegfeld dies, and then there will be a, a revival for a short period of time after that. It's really based on the Parisian uh, Folie Bergère, but they're a mixture of singing, parading, dancing, comic skits, and, and above all, they were famous for their elevation and glamorization of beautiful women. <coughs> Uh, nearly every star of the stage and film for the next generation will have passed through the Follies. Um, one would be, well, the, the, most of the cast of Wizard of Oz, the, the main players, like Ray Bolger, for example, Billy Burke, who was actually Ziegfeld's wife, and she was a big uh, part of the Follies when she would go down the aisle, and this would be, by the way, at the New Amsterdam Theater. When you go there now, you need to remove your sandals because you are on hallowed ground where the Ziegfeld Follies happened. This is where all the great performers worked and it's still pretty much intact. But when she sat down at her seat, that would be the time when the show could begin. It was done with great ceremony and pomp and splendor. And these openings would have uh, all the important people in town, the same crowd that would be going to the Metropolitan Opera openings and such. So, the, um, so this 1919 edition of the Ziegfeld Follies is the most magnificent and memorable of all. Now, first of all, it featured new music composed by Irving Berlin, and it would open a new aspect of his career because from now on, he would concentrate less on individual songs and more on entire reviews or musicals and he will thereafter also become an independent music publisher, giving him complete freedom over his creative output. So once again, 1919, a really important year. The 1919 Follies featured some of the greatest stars ever to grace those productions. Uh, one of them, the biggest star was Marilyn Miller. She was a remarkable talent because she was equally gifted as a singer and a dancer and also a great actor. Uh, and she uh, danced in, in this review to one of the big hits from it, which is Mandy by Irving Berlin. Uh, it's a kind of a cakewalk number sung by the great Eddie Cantor. is another beloved Folly star who would later move into movies and eventually television, and he performed comic monologues, solo songs, skits, and most of these dealt with the issues of the day, including President Wilson's absence overseas at the, the conference, things like that, and of course, prohibition. Uh, another major star of the 1919 Follies was Burt Williams and he was the first great African-American solo star of the Follies. He typically played a forlorn everyman figure and sang some, uh, of some comically sad plight as in the number about bootlegging here, the moon shines on the moonshine. And the, the lyrics are something like, uh, far up in the mountaintops, away from the eyes of cops, the moon shines on the old distillery. That's the, the so it's a, kind of a, a comfort knowing that that's still going on up there. And this is one of several prohibition numbers in the Follies. And to those of us who've seen the movie Chicago or have seen it on Broadway, the, the, um, the song uh, Mr. Cellophane is a tribute to Burt Williams. It has that same kind of uh, woe be gone, every man figure who is kind of beat upon by the world. And, and Burt Williams was really like that too. He was very sad that W.C. Fields, who starred with him in the next year, in the 1920 Follies, said he was the funniest man I ever saw and the saddest man I ever knew. And that's because he was um, actually a, a, a light-skinned African-American. He was actually from the Caribbean, but he they still uh, wanted him to black up because it was still the days of the minstrels and because he was black it was assumed he would do this. And he also uh, was kind of not in the rest of the crowd because the whole cast, was, everybody was white in this. So he felt very left out even though he was one of the most highly paid stars right up there with Al Jolson 
uh, uh, he was very, very much appreciated for his art, but not, uh, not welcomed as a person, which is very tragic. Um, so and another star here was uh, the exotic Kathleen Rose, prop popularly known as Dolores, who invented this kind of uh, uh, detached persona look that was used in Vogue magazine. And, and she's very ahead of her time, very modern, and uh, not surprisingly, she moved from here to France shortly after the Follies. Here she is in one of her costumes, and we look at these today, they're magnificent, somewhere between magnificent and outlandish, uh, but, but that's Dolores. She was a very, uh, had a, a great deal of exotic sort of character to her. <clears throat> Ziegfeld has overspent extravagantly for these 1919 uh, Follies, this edition. He wanted it to be the greatest ever. And four days before the opening, he asks early Irving Berlin for a classical number. He called it classical number. So he could use some of the dozens of costumes that he still had available that were going unused. And so the result is this song, A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody, and it was sung by the classically trained tenor John Steele. Now the original referenced actual melodies that, that were really popular, classical melodies like the Dvorak's Humoresque, uh, the Schumann Träumerei, uh, the, uh, the, serenade, the Schubert famous serenade from Schwanengesang, uh, Mendelssohn's Spring Song, these were all the, there were about five of these numbers. And each number would feature a, a woman going on stage personifying that song in some way. She'd be dressed in a ma manner that suggested that. So really, literally, a pretty girl is like a melody, very literally, is the, the, uh, the idea behind it. And this would be the biggest hit of the show, so much so that it would hereafter serve as the theme song for the Ziegfeld Follies at every production thereafter. And this number also represents yet another divide from Irving Berlin in this year. After having become the supreme master of the ragtime song, he will now be established as the master of the ballad, of the large ballad. He had written some smaller ones earlier, but this is now the fully formed ballad that will form a large part of the scores for his productions that he is now going to begin mounting in the next year onwards. And for this, I just wanted to mention, there's a remarkable Hollywood film. Uh, many of you probably have seen it already. It's in 1936, starring William Powell and Myrna Loy, and a whole, the, everybody in Hollywood, basically, was in a, a, in a scene from it. It's the great Ziegfeld. Uh, and A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody has a wonderful, elaborate recreation of the Ziegfeld set from 1919, and provides us with a glimpse into the lavishness of these productions. And there it is, and we're going to have our tenor sing in front of it. Uh, the, the top of it has, is crowned with a, with a young woman in a, in a large dress, separated by a whole uh, rank of a bunch of others right below her. And then men in tuxedos ranking against that kind of cake-like looking thing. And on the outside, of course, pianists at every step. And then big uh, ranks of women dancing down the steps. So that should add some context to this. <laughs> I have an ear for music, and I have an eye for a maid. I like a pretty girl. Played. They go together 
let's say, for something completely different. <laughs> uh, with his rolling eyes and comic timing, Eddie Cantor was the perfect performer to introduce one of Irving Berlin's most irreverent songs, one that's filled with innuendo and double entendre. The song was in fact considered so brazen at that time that it wasn't, sing in more, it wasn't sung in more respectable establishments. So no further explanation is necessary. If you don't already know this one, well, you'll be surprised when you hear, you'll be surprised. You'd be surprised. is also the birth year, by the way, of another set of reviews by George White. These are George White's scandals, he called them. And like the Ziegfeld Follies, they're going to have a lifetime of about 20 years, but they're going to represent the more current, <coughs> roaring 20s generation with the sounds of jazz and a little bit more modern and not so glamorous, but a little more risque. And um, G George Gershwin is going to be one of the first composers that starts writing scores for George White. George White used to be a dancer, actually, in the Follies earlier in this decade, and he's going to break away and do this new kind of review uh, coming up. <laughs> 
musical tastes in 1919 were still basically universal and undifferentiated. Uh, opera, popular song, and art song were consumed by the entire gamut of the American public, just as they had been in the 19th century. And Enrico Caruso is still one of the most popular crossover artists in America among most classes of people, and certainly shared much of the same audience with the songs that we have been hearing. So prepare yourself for a song that will differ substantially from all others on this program. And it's included because of its special place that this composer has in 1919. And it gives us a fascinating cross-section of what's happening elsewhere in America right now. Now, many of our songs today uh, are chronicling current events or social mores. We move now to the world of current ideas and it's in the eclectic mind of Charles Griffiths that so many of these threads converge. Uh, first of all, a few words just about his life. Um, he was born in Elmira, New York, and after early studies on piano in his hometown, he went to Berlin, studied there in Germany, and uh, mostly piano, but he also had composition lessons with Engelbert Humperdinck, who was the composer, of course, of Hansel and Gretel uh, and other popular operas of that day and returned here and immediately went to work for the Hackley School, which is a private boys' school, and he was just the local music director there from there until the end of his life. So he worked really hard days at work, and then at, at night he would work really hard days trying to compose and to get his works known a bit. And it was in 1919, uh, his breakout year. Uh, the performances that year included debuts of his works with such orchestras like the Boston Symphony and the New York Philharmonic. Uh, and, uh, and he attended those, but was unable to go to any more after about December 5th because he was very ill. He had run his health down working all those years, and um, he was in a, in a sanatorium at Loomis, New York, and he died there at the beginning of next year. So another one of these whose, whose star was just on the horizon, and and uh, died as quickly as he was known. And for years after, uh, reviewers and critics would lament this terrible loss of such an amazing voice in American music. But because he was so busy, he fortunately left us a lot of songs and some, a few wonderful orchestral pieces and some piano music. Um, so this, uh, there are some who say, well, he just, was, was in bad health and he died that way, but, but many think also that he might have been an actual uh, victim of this flu epidemic, which is still going on. So um, he's very eclectic uh, in, in a lot of ways. The uh, um, first thing is he's very impressionistic. Impressionism is very big right now, both in art and in music. And he also had a passion for things Asian pottery and Japanese painting were very dear to him. So there's a little Orientalism in this music as well. And a big one for most of his late works was that of aestheticism. And aestheticism is uh, the idea of art for art's sake without being attached to any kind of a moral or um, uh, any other kind of agenda. So it's just pure art for art's sake. It's a very much a Victorian thing. But in the hands of the Scottish poet Fiona MacLeod, who wrote the text for the song we're about to hear, uh, this, this aestheticism is colored also, also with Celtic legend and with mysticism and a kind of a sensual, sensuousness and eroticism. It's kind of mixed in there under the surface. So he, he was really intrigued by this poet. Uh, after the poet died in 1905, it was discovered that Fiona MacLeod was a pseudonym for William Sharp, who was a Scottish writer. And this was his persona that he assumed for these kinds of texts. Um, also, his, these texts suggest uh, synesthesia, the blending of, of the senses. And you get this here also, there's almost a perfume-like kind of smell that goes through the music. And this is part of that aestheticism as well. Um, also, uh, uh, Scriabin, who had just died, also was very, of course, consumed with, with this synesthesia stuff. But, but uh, he also used synthetic scales, which we'll also hear in this song. <laughs> 
So here we're riding again on that 1919 border in which it's a really good idea to see what's going on because there, things are going to change now. After a horrific world war, the gentility and sens sensitivity of Victorianism, the, including aestheticism, is going to no longer be relevant to people. And that's why I think a lot of composers who were really well appreciated up to that time are suddenly dropped, like who wrote really fine songs like Edward McDowell and Amy Beach, that they're too genteel perhaps for a modern age that's been hardened by this horrific experience that just happened. Um, so those fall out of fashion, but Griffiths comes here, I, I see him as a, sort of a culmination of all that, that stuff going on. Uh, it, the, what's fascinating about his music too is the interplay between the surface and what's going on underneath. This has a very calm surface to it, and yet it, it, there are all these surges coming up of, of climaxes, but then they get subdued one after another until finally at the end they are liberated in this uh, massive climax at the end. This is the trajectory of a lot of his pieces, and this, this one does it really, uh, really gloriously. There's uh, just to, the text is a bit puzzling, but according to Griffiths, he had he explained it in uh, in Fiona McLeod's words uh, that there is an old mystical legend that when a soul among the dead woos a soul of the living so that both might be reborn as one, that the sign is a dark rose, a rose of, of flame in the heart of the night. Thank you. 
And now uh, we're going to close by, by talking about some of the things we heard about today. This year has been really the best of times. We have welcoming boys from the Great War, the breakout year for Gershwin and Griffiths, and big changes for Irving Berlin, who's writing music for Broadway shows from now on and will become an independent publisher, the greatest Siegfeld Follies production ever. And it was the worst of times, the uh, parting with a beloved president and the absence and eventual disability of another, uh, mourning our war dead, uh, prohibition, strikes, and fears of Bolshevism, uh, devastating worldwide pandemic, promising giants of American music who are lost to us just as their promise was being realized. So how are we to cope with this kind of dizzying pace? Well, this is my recommendation. The, a brand new 1919 song comes out here with advice that we might pass on along to generations to come who might themselves find themselves in a uh, need of a moment's escape. And the music is by Ernest Ball, who once said that he became a successful composer when he learned to write songs that came from his heart and were about things that he knew. And the song is one of those that hits the sweetest spot in the heart, as few can do, and will do so for generations to come. 20 years from now, it will be recorded by Gene Autry. 40 years from now, by Connie Francis, and also by Pat Boone. And in 60 years, by Willie Nelson. And on a Sunday afternoon, 100 years from now, by a lovely audience at a Fall Island event, who will be invited to sing along on the second chorus. Thank you.